We're going to try to stay, uh, stay on time, and our plan on this one is to make this uh, a seminar where we're actually going to spend a fair amount of time talking with you about these issues. Um, I'm Marty Samuels. This is uh, Hank Grass in the very end, Ed Wing, Bob Baer, and Pete Watson, who have joined me. We were asked by the uh, organizing uh, committee for our reunion to put together a, a panel of people in medicine from our class and to do something that was relevant to what was going on in medicine these days. So we uh, talked about it a bit and we decided for a couple of reasons to deal with uh, the issue of uh, burnout, which is a zeitgeist in the world today, not just in medicine. We picked it really for a couple of reasons. One is it's, it's a medical problem, as you'll hear. That is, the problem itself is a medical problem and there's a lot of neuroscience and neurobiology behind it that you'll hear a little bit about. Uh, secondly, it's a very serious problem among uh, physicians and surgeons, and you'll hear more about that as we go along as well. Could be that this is the group which is the most affected by the phenomenon of any, any group in society. We're not, we're not sure of that, but that's certainly an important one. And, uh, and equally importantly, we thought it would be important for everybody here, uh, not just people in our class and of our vintage, uh, many of whom are actually retired from work now, but but for people of uh, younger ages who are here, and for people in our own vintage uh, to talk about burnout, not just as professional burnout, but as uh, burnout in life. And um, what we'd like to do is test a, an hypothesis with you that, uh, that a Williams-type uh, education, that a liberal arts education is, uh, is an immunization or a partial immunization against this uh, phenomenon. We'd like to see what you think about that. So my, uh, I'm gonna spend five minutes, each of the group is going to spend five minutes uh, uh, on their perspectives. I'll tell you who, who they are as I introduce them. And then we'll spend half our time in discussion, we hope. Um, so I just wanted to tell you, it put, put on two simple slides. First, the definition of burnout. Um, and uh, well, these are the definitions that we're going to use today. I, uh, most people in social psychology uh, use these definitions. It's a feeling of emotional exhaustion uh, characterized by cynicism, that is the a uh, lack of confidence in other people's motivations, uh, combined with, uh, uh, with depersonalization, where, whereby we mean uh, taking away human qualities of other people, uh, taking away their human qualities, and finally, perceived uh, ineffectiveness. Uh, underlying this, there are several possible causes. These are five, and uh, I'm going to uh, leave this on just in the background as the other people talk so that you can ruminate a little bit about this yourself as we're talking about this. Uh, overwhelming demands and, uh, and work overload, social conflicts by which is meant uh, the work-life balance, for example, how much time do people want to spend working uh, versus other aspects of life. Uh, loss of resources, people to help you when your whatever your work uh, your work is, assistance and so on. Insufficient rewards, which fall into two categories: monetary rewards, but uh, equally important, other kinds of uh, emotional rewards. And fa uh, and finally, probably the most uh, important in the world at large, and that is this feeling of lack of fairness and uh, and equity, and and the feeling of being marginalized, which we of course see all over the world today. And this has led needless to say, to not just burnout, but serious conflict and loss of life around the world. And we hear about it virtually every, every single day. So that's, uh, those are the definitions. Uh, I'm gonna turn first to uh, Ed Wing, uh, who uh, spent his life in leadership, his, his, uh, his career in leadership in medicine. He's a very distinguished infectious disease uh, expert, expert who uh, was in Pittsburgh at the head of the, um, head of the ID uh, infectious disease section there. He then came to be the head of medicine at Brown, and then he became the dean uh, at the Warren Alpert uh, Medical School at Brown. So, Ed, if you would start with some thoughts about what you've uh, noticed with, from the perspective of a leader in medicine with this problem. So, <clears throat> thank you, Marty. I'm going to um, talk about, <clears throat> about burnout in a slightly different way. And by the way, Marty's article on burnout is really superb. It's a, it's a very, very uh, interesting uh, sort of explanation and then solution to the problem of burnout, particularly for physicians. But I want to start with a, a, a story about a grand rounds that I heard at Pittsburgh uh, many years ago. And it was about doctors and stress and suicide. 
So we'd had some recent suicides. And so these psychiatrists were talking about the characteristics, the attributes which are necessary for a physician. <clears throat> and he named two. One of them was uh, altruism slash empathy. So doctors want to do good. It's part of our profession. I've been advising medical students and prospective medical students my whole career. They stand out in terms of wanting to do good, to help people and to be empathetic. If you don't have those characteristics, you should do something else. But I'd be a lawyer, and it's nothing against lawyers. But... <laughs> sorry, sorry. I knew that would get a few responses. But... And the second characteristic is, um, is perfectionism or compulsiveness. OCD. You want your doctor to look carefully at the lab data. You don't want him to, to blow it off or to skip things. So you want those two characteristics are extremely important. So altruism, perfectionism, wanting to do an absolutely perfect job. And they are very difficult, the psychiatrist pointed out, together. If you put those two things together, people, doctors try to help people all the time. They want to do the best, they want to do the best job for people that they can. They're very empathetic, but they don't want to make a mistake. And doctors do make mistakes. And one of the problems is it can be life and death. So just to give you an anecdote, when I was an intern at the Brigham, what's now the Brigham and Women's Hospital, I had been on every other night, 36 hours on, 12 hours off. In the middle of one night, I was trying to get some sleep and a nurse came in and said, the patient needs need something for pain. They were having pain. And I said, give him a couple of aspirin. In those days, we didn't have ibuprofen. We had aspirin. So I said, give a couple of aspirin. And I went back to sleep. I was so t <clears throat> tired. I woke up in a cold sweat. Of five minutes later, went rushing out to the nurse's station because I remembered that this person had, had a dangerous anaphylactic reaction to aspirin. Could have died. The nurse said, don't worry, doctor. I knew he was allergic. I didn't, you know, the nurse saved my <laughs> butt for not the first time either. So, but that kind of mistake is something terrifying to doctors. We do make mistakes. And it's a huge conflict. And it really contributes to the stress on doctors, those ideas that you really have to, to be altruistic and to, to be perfect. So um, I think some of the stress comes from that. I think that um, um, <clears throat> this problem is not new, this is the second point I want to make, that I've seen it throughout my whole career, I've experienced it myself, it's something which is ongoing and it's, it's throughout the medical profession, it's getting a lot of publicity now, but it's certainly not new. And I'll say th a couple of things about the Williams education. I think the Williams education contributed to it. A little bit different with Marty saying. I agree with Marty that it can be a, a, an anecdote, antidote, but it contributes because the humanities educated us in terms of values, in terms of people, in terms of empathy, in terms of understanding people. And that's the first, out, first thing. And the second thing, if you're in the sciences at all, or economics, you have to be very compulsive. You have to work extremely hard, and you have to be perfect in a way. So in a sense, our education at Williams is good. It, those things are good. It's just the combination is difficult. So I would posit that everybody in this room has some degree of that risk. We do want to do good. We are perfectionists, and we're hard on ourselves. So I think, I think, uh, that's my perspective on the issues and some of the causes of burnout. I, I'm not going to talk about retirement, which I've had a great career, by the way. I, I've loved what I've done, um, but I'm reaching the point where I'm thinking about retirement. And Ron Bodenson, a couple of weeks ago, at a lunch given by Bob Baer, uh, had a very interesting comment about retirement. I said, how do you like it? You know, what's going on? And he said, when he was in his job in a corporation or a firm, he was under stress, external stress. The job, the company, the, the firm put stress on him. In retirement, and it was a lot of stress. In retirement, Ron said, you can, you can choose your own level of stress and how you do it. It can be lower, it can be stress from different things, but you have the choice more in retirement. It sounded pretty good to me. So 
That'll be my next step. That's, that's great, Ed. Thank you very much. Let's turn to Bob Bear, who's uh, sitting uh, next to uh, next to Eddie. Um, Bob is an ophthalmologist, has had a very distinguished career as, as an ophthalmologist in Providence, uh, Rhode Island, associated with Brown uh, University. And uh, he has an interesting perspective in that he not only is practicing and continues to practice medicine, but he also leads a large group and is functioning both as an administrative leader and as a practicing doctor at the same time. So, Bob, what are your thoughts about this? Thanks, Marty. Um, I've, you know, I've now spent 40 years as the managing partner of a group that started out as three ophthalmologists and now is 16. And really, have, uh, I think, burn, as Ed mentioned, burnout has been a factor in medical care uh, for, forever. But uh, the situation is changing significantly. And I thought I'd give a little overview of where things stand now. Uh, in that someplace between around 40 and over 50% of physicians, depending on the specialty, are expressed that they are experiencing burnout. Ophthalmology, fortunately, I guess, is one of the lower uh, specialties, and about 43% in the study that just came out a couple of weeks ago expressed some degree of burnout. Um, that's 25% more than in the study done four years ago. So the phenomenon of burnout has changed dramatically in the recent past. And there are a bunch of different factors uh, because the, there have been certain factors that have always been present. But the presence of electronic medical record, record uh, keeping, um, regulatory oversight, and uh, insurance constraints have played a huge role. The insurance constraints primarily, I think, from the point of view of decision making being interfered with by prior authorizations required for drugs or, or necessary procedures. Um, and I think in ophthalmology, that's going to create a, a very significant change in, in burnout rates from a low point to a much higher one. Um, and ophthalmic practice is a very intensive, clinic, in, at least clinical ophthalmology, intensive uh, patient care environment where 40 to 60 patients are usually seen a day by the individual physician. Um, and uh, fortunately, we have a small part of the body to look at. We have terrific abilities to assess those uh, because we can see most everything we need to look at, which most physicians don't have the opportunity to do. Um, and uh, the psychological benefits of what you're doing for people is offset some of the pace. But uh, we've, we're really basically peace workers and we're like little hamsters on, on exercise wheels going around from room to room seeing patients, as most of you who've seen ophthalmologists probably have experienced. Uh, from the patient point of view, electronic medical records have interfered um, in that you get to see the back of your physician a lot more than you used to. Um, but from the physician point of view, it adds a completely different perspective, especially in a patient intensive practice like ours. Because if EMR adds three or four minutes per patient interaction, um, that's about um, 120 to 180 minutes a day in a day that's the same length in terms of patient care. And something has to give. And usually it's the, the life quality of the physician who's doing it, uh, doing, delivering the care. The regulatory aspects mean that if you do something uh, carefully and, as Ed mentioned, with, uh, with uh, real intensity of not making any mistakes, you're evaluating your patients properly, and yet you have to check an extra box to say that you did what you already did, even though it's in the record already. And finally, uh, the, th when you know that a particular drug is the right drug for an individual or they need a particular study, it's not good enough to know that. You have to get somebody else to approve certain things and that adds to the uh, level of, uh, of potential burnout. And this has really been uh, quite obvious in our group where people are finding the um, factors that, I uh, can't remember which slide is up, uh, the slide uh, that is up over me, uh, they're finding that these aspects are now playing a role for them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I, I see that constraint really being a major uh, problem for medical delivery, uh, medical care delivery going forward, uh, because patients uh, still have the same needs, and yet there, isn't, uh, there aren't enough physicians or 
physician uh, implementers uh, to really deliver the care if we don't have the time to do it. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I'm going to turn to Peter uh, Watson, who's sitting uh, right next to me now. Pete uh, was one of the first uh, perinatologists or maternal fetal medicine, medicine specialists. It's a subspecialty of obstetrics and gynecology in which uh, these doctors take care of the highest risk pregnancies. It's a very, very, very high stress, intense specialty. He was one of the first people in this field and certainly one of the first people in the great northwest to do it. He's in, Port in Portland. And um, he's going to tell us, I think, a very compelling story. Pete? Well, OK, no pressure there. Um, <laughs> If I wasn't stress overloaded before, I... <laughs> now I am. Thanks, Marty, for that. <laughs> um, well, I, it's an honor to be here. Uh, the um, folks I'm sitting with, I mean, these are my medical idols. I wondered um, why am I included on such an illustrious panel. Um, I'm just an ordinary community doc, and, and then it dawned on me, I'm the only one in this group who's retired, so I can speak from experience, and the other um, is that I actually burned out, um, so I can speak from very personal experience there. I, when I graduated from Williams, I went to medical school, uh, I chose obstetrics and gynecology, and in particular I chose as Marty alluded, I chose high-risk obstetrics. Um, and when I graduated from fellowship, I took a job in Portland, Oregon, where I live today. Um, and that job uh, uh, presented me with uh, a number of challenges. I was woefully unprepared. Um, I was in the midst of trying to deal with um, personal family of origin issues. I had been adopted and I was really struggling with that, with my adoptive family. And uh, sadly, um, our younger son, uh, while I was in high-risk obstetrics training, had been born with multiple congenital malformations. Um, so was dealing with a fair amount of of grief and uncertainty having to do with that at the time. Um, the setting uh, in Portland, uh, the hospital uh, where I worked, uh, the group that I eventually formed, uh, was toxic. Um, and it, long story short, uh, it didn't take long for me to burn out. Um, I had experiences on a frequent basis similar to what Ed has described in, uh, in his aspirin, a uh, very telling aspirin story. Um, they came fast and furious. Uh, I became uh, emotionally overloaded. I became profoundly cynical and um, woefully ineffective. Uh, I was a danger to myself, my family. Uh, and my patients. I was called in by my chief of staff one day and he said, you have a choice. Uh, you can be fired uh, or you can get help and recover and continue practice. Uh, but you're going to have to take time off. And I said, fine, I'll take time off. It didn't take me long to make a decision. Uh, it was, at that point, the lowest point in my life. I thought I was going to lose everything. Um, I thought I was going to lose my wife, my family, uh, my profession, all of which I loved. Um, I started in on uh, a process of psychoanalysis with uh, a colleague of Dr. Grass's in Portland, uh, an analyst, and process that took nine years and was worth every day. Um, I 
left my practice, uh, came back to work, and started a new practice. And in that practice, uh, I designed and worked with colleagues and coworkers to build uh, an experience for, for me, for my partners, for my staff and the patients, um, an experience that I hoped would prevent burnout for them, uh, that combined the elements that data had shown were important in doing just that. Um, preventing and dealing with emotional overload, uh, providing uh, the individuals with, uh, that we've spoken of uh, with a sense of control, uh, providing adequate resources, uh, looking to reward uh, those of us on the care side um, and indirectly our patients uh, appropriately for the work we were doing in a good way, um, to um, match our values with, um, with what our aspirations were, to make sure that we were all in sync and doing what we wanted to do and what we should do. Um, and it worked, and it was tremendously rewarding in that sense. Um, and I wouldn't have gotten through it, um, the key for me in my recovery was uh, my wife, whom many of you met last year in, um, in England, and I'm sure you would get a sense of why she was so effective. Uh, she's doggedly persistent. Um, she has... Uh, an unfailing um, bullshit meter. <laughs> and as a former investigative reporter, she doesn't miss a thing. Um, my close personal friends, um, my two sons, um, equally supportive and valuable, and my therapist, um, who Turns out, uh, I was married to a good friend of Harriet's, and uh, she tells a story one day. He said uh, she's out walking with uh, the wife and the two of them. Harriet says, "Ah, oh, you know, I credit David with with Peter's survival. Um, he would have come to uh, not such a great end had David, my therapist, uh, not been so helpful." And the wife said, "Geez, I never would have known." I mean patient doctor confidentiality, he never tells me a thing. And Harriet says, not in my case. <laughs> um, and for that, I credit her um, more than I can say. Um, and I approached retirement uh, with the same intent that I, I didn't want to burn out in retirement. Um, so, I tried to apply the same principles um, in retirement uh, that I applied with my new practice and, and new goals and aspirations. I've gotten involved with the Indivisible Movement, trying to bring the same sorts of prevent burnout on a community level, hopefully if Indivisible is successful on a national level, um, matching our values, uh, building the resources that we need, uh, making sure that we do uh, what we need to do to protect us all. Um, as to Williams, I would agree with that. I, I don't, it certainly didn't prevent my getting, uh, my burning out, but I think it helped me get through it uh, in terms of learning how to learn, uh, in terms of matching values with actual practice and having the sense of the importance of friends, family, and community. Um, 
And for that, I'll always be grateful. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Hank Grass, who wants to uh, stand at the podium to make his, uh, his uh, remarks. These would be the, f the final formal remarks, and then we'd like to spend the second half of our time in discussion. Um, Hank uh, is a psychiatrist. Uh, he and I uh, actually went to medical school together at the University of Cincinnati after leaving uh, here. And uh, then he trained in psychiatry and went out uh, also to Portland, Oregon. Two people from Providence and two from Portland by chance here in uh, uh, East Coast and West Coast, all peas here today. Um, where, he, uh, where he has become known as the major figure who takes care of doctors who are ill. Uh, and uh, he has uh, essentially founded the, the field of the doctors taking care of doctors who are in need of psychiatric help. And uh, we'd like to get your perspective on this today also, uh, Hank. Well, thank you, Marty, for your kind remarks. Um, and um, I guess I use this podium for protection. <laughs> But I'm used to speaking from this vantage point for um, I like to see the audience. I like to make eye contact with all of you um, <clears throat> and not speak from slides. And so um, what you need to know is that um, close to a year and a half ago, I had a near fatal event, uh, a cerebellar stroke. This is the huge part in, in the back of our head, in our brain, that controls extraordinary number of functions, which Marty knows better than do I, but I've learned more about the cerebellum than I ever knew in college or in medical school, because mine wasn't working very well. So at any rate, um, I hope to be cogent today. Uh, consequences of <clears throat> a stroke are that you don't always regulate your emotions very well. Mine were never very well in control to begin with. And usually um, this sort of emotional um, reaction would occur to me in circumstances like this. Um, so <clears throat> my remarks are going to be a bit circuitous. I uh, hope you'll be able to follow the breadcrumbs. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to be thinking about this question, and maybe we'll get to it in the remarks. But uh, I don't think it's fair to ask a question that you yourself aren't prepared to answer. So I'll ask the question and then give you my answer, which will lead us into the talk, hopefully, without too many detours. So if I start to wander, somebody can raise their hand. <clears throat> so uh, the question is, why are we here? Uh, I came. 3,000 plus miles um, to get here uh, isn't my normal sort of thing to do to come to alumni functions. I'm a bit on the shy side. <clears throat> and um, I would posit to you that we're here because of love and because of attachment experiences that we had not only with one another, but with our mentors. And Marty and I had this delightful phone conversation a while back when I uh, reminisced with him, well, who were our mentors when we got here? Who are the people that we still remember that were our surrogate parents? And we both came up with one singular person. I came up with two. And so my uh, remarks, I think, are going to center us around adult life development, which I think uh, an institution like Williams, for me and perhaps for my colleagues, played a pivotal role and um, in an invisible way. And what I would teach my students frequently as I was supervising them in the art of psychotherapy was it's not what you say to your patients, it's how you are, what sort of human being you are how you regard them, uh, the conversation about empathy that Ed spoke of. Uh, and that, that only can be modeled, it can't be taught. 
quite frankly. So I'm here because I have an empathic connection to this part of my adult life development, a very crucial early stage for all of us, one of the times that we actually leave the nest and embark on a great journey that we often don't know the end point to, but we have the courage and naiveness and arrogance of adolescence because we all arrive here. I have to remember to breathe. Um, we all arrive here in our adolescence in a very unformed state and uh, magically we get to graduation supposedly as full functioning adults, but not really. Uh, quite frankly, this was the conversation that I often had with doctors and medical students and trainees was, um, how, how in the world did you uh, figure out what you wanted to do with your life? Uh, getting back to the basics, uh, things that we all know. We're primates. We're descendant from apes and chimps. We have primate brains. Uh, usually we are born one at a time, sometimes two or three at a time. But um, we have huge brains. I'm drifting into neuroscience, which is Marty's territory. Uh, forgive me if I branch inadvertently, but um, the amount of learning and information that we need to survive uh, is recorded in that brain. It surpasses the amount of information that can be stored on our, our genetic material. So the learning that we undergo in those first two decades of life is extraordinarily important to the rest of our journey. And uh, thankfully for me, uh, there is a phenomenon called neuroplasticity, meaning that even at an advanced age, you can learn to do some th simple things like talk and walk and think and uh, speak to a large audience like this and make sense. So um, as I was laying in my bed in rehab, thinking I'm just a kid here being taken care of. Uh, my psychological brain was still alive and I was taking notes. I couldn't even swallow without aspirating all of my food. I couldn't talk, I couldn't communicate, uh, and yet uh, this team of caregivers who were very kind and empathic uh, nurtured me. I had to ask somebody to come and assist me to walk to the bathroom with a walker in the middle of the night. Um, and these were women from another part of the world who were working hard as nursing assistants and who were uh, showing me extraordinary kindness. Uh, strangers taking care of this stranger. Uh, they did not know me as a physician. They know me as a human being who was impaired. Sorry. I don't apologize for my emotions. I try to at times. So my story is, I'll try not to take up too much time, Mr. Dr. Chairman, but uh, my story is one of asking you to reflect on your own attachment history. How many of you in the audience are familiar with attachment theory? Many. Okay, I'm very glad to see that. So this revolutionized psychological thinking and my particular specialty uh, halfway through my career. It was like Einstein's theory of relativity, only in psychological sense, in that uh, it sort of unraveled the mystery of the unconscious mind, which Dr. Freud had so wonderfully tried to explain. He was a neurologist after all and one of our first psychiatrists. Uh, so uh, my answer to the question is, why am I here? It's because of the love and loyalty to my professors at Williams, who started me on a path of believing in myself. I was not bright enough as a pre-medical student to be an honor student. Uh, I did not have the discipline or the compulsive traits at that point in time. 
So a uh, very nice gentleman who was a geneticist uh, saw who I was inside and said, Henry, why don't you spend a summer here helping me with my genetics research, which I gladly took him up on it and uh, I think uh, found my footing as a human being. He was an awkward human being, now deceased, and I don't think his uh, relationship skills or attachment capacities were great, but they were good enough for me. I had, um, as many of you have, um, an experience of parents who had survived World War II, um, and so they carried their own trauma. And my panelists and myself have all seen trauma in our lives, either self-inflicted or inflicted upon us by other means. And um, I think the title of this talk has to do with our uh, response to trauma of one kind, whether it's historic or contemporary, institutional or within us, uh, unresolved issues. I have not really thought much about uh, the impact of my parents' trauma on who I am until I myself underwent a lot of psychotherapy and uh, actually thought about this on the plane ride here as I was trying to assemble my remarks. Um, so how do we survive trauma? Well, I think, again, if I can take us back to our beginnings in life, we observe long before we're capable of language, either understanding it or using it to communicate with our caregivers. We watch our parents carefully as they try to manage their adult lives, and that process continues on into our uh, pre-adolescence, adolescence, and post-adolescence, and for me, on into my adult years. I, like many of my physicians, experienced a significant delay in my development. Medical studies will do that to you. We're kind of like kids that wake up when we're in our early 30s, like, how the hell did I get here? Am I really a grown-up? Everybody addresses me as a doctor, but I don't feel like one. I don't quite know what to do, but yet I had to make this, this decision almost a decade prior, and uh, how well am I suited for it? Dr. Samuels refers to the fact that I've treated many of our colleagues, and I have, I've had that great privilege. Unfortunately, I've had the experience of doing psychological autopsies on my colleagues, our colleagues who did not survive, who succumbed to self-annihilation, in other words, suicide. They reached midlife and uh, encountered what we call a perfect storm psychologically. Uh, the cards just start falling down and the pain is unbearable. So um, I began to work on this field of physician health and so on. How am I doing on time, Marty? Running out, okay. Um, I'll try not to talk too fast at any rate. Um, so over and over again, the theme would come up in therapy. Um, how did you get here? Do you really like what you're doing? Are you marooned in this life experience? And can we think about the love in your life, the resilience you have uh, that you take with you from many sources? And can you learn how to adapt to your circumstances if uh, need be to change almost everything in your life, uh, not in a destructive, but in a creative way. And so these are conversations that would uh, take the span of several years sometimes. My job was to um, make sure that the person was safe and had enough time and energy and hope uh, and caring and empathy for me that they could survive this trauma and uh, find some other path. I went through my own version of this. I won't go into that. Um, so uh, it's all about love. And uh, a lot of beautiful books and poetry and theater uh, have been created about love. 
but where does love reside in the brain? Well, it's probably spread out throughout the brain <clears throat> in multiple places. And it's both a conscious and an unconscious experience in the brain and in the mind and in the psyche. But it is what allows us to survive, quite frankly. Uh, this takes us back to being primates and being loved by our nurturing caregivers, usually our mothers, not always. And so I think um, having love in our lives at this point in time is what allows us to um, survive. I certainly could not have recovered uh, were it not for the love of my wife and my children and indirectly for my caregivers. But I think that journey began here and often, why do people become teachers or therapists? I think it's because they have a love for other human beings that takes the form of their art. I had a wonderful conversation with Ed yesterday, and I was uh, grieving the fact that I no longer have a uh, professional life, and he is still enjoying his work with patients, very, very ill patients, but nonetheless enjoying it. And uh, we had a mutual uh, identification with the importance of empathy. Uh, so with that, I think I'll draw to a close here. So several books that I would leave you with that speak about these issues much more beautifully than I can. One is a very old book um, that you may know of. Um, um, sorry. Um, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, and uh, the author will come to me here in a second. Uh, the other is a very recent book called The General Theory of Love, which is a summary of attachment theory and neurobiology, which I, is a wonderful small thin paperback written by three different psychiatrists of three different generations. Uh, Victor Frankl is the author of Man's Search for Meaning, and he was the psychiatrist that survived being in concentration camps in World War II Germany and wrote this book about it. And uh, what helped him survive was his ability to realize that, um, in his own words, and these are an adaptation of his ideas, that humans uh, need to be generative and have a purpose in life. And so as I and my fellow panel members struggle with retirement, uh, to some degree, both of those uh, issues are no longer at our fingertips. We may or may not have the capacity to be generative and our purpose in life as identified by our professional uh, credentials and our chosen field are no longer um, accessible to us. But I think it's incumbent on all of us to reinvent ourselves in this way to come up with another purpose. And in my case, to turn around to the people that were so kind and loving to me, my family and friends. And I was so preoccupied with my career uh, in trying to help my fellow physicians that I think I worked myself to the point of exhaustion. Uh, so that is my principal regret and a debt that I intend to repay. Thank you for your remark. Thank, Thank you. you, Hank. Thank you, Hank. So, John, uh, do, do, do you want me to just handle this myself, or would you like to? Uh, we like to uh, have a discussion. We have uh, 15 minutes left, uh, pers various, various perspectives. Yes, would you mind just saying who you were, what your vintage is, so everybody knows? Okay. Uh, this is Vince Graham Show. I'm actually uh, Barnard class of 67, Mary Bell and Stern Williams, 67. Um, first, I, I want to thank uh, all of you in the panel, uh, especially for the candor. And uh, I, I share the experience of losing a newborn to multiple congenital defects. And I, I know how that can influence your career. Um, I'm also co-chairing a, co a uh, forum for the National Academy of Medicine on Health Professions Education. And we have a subgroup that is looking at burnout. And I'm going to take some of this back to them and contact some of you. Uh, we find that there's more being done right now with 
the initial stages of education, whether it's medical school and nursing school, PTMP, et cetera, uh, to try to address burnout. But listening to you, my question is, um, what could we, what could I take back or what could you share about mid-career? How, how would you, standing where you are now, um, think back on what could have been done uh, mid-career to help you address issues of burnout and prevent burnout that we could then take back to help professionals I've, uh, I'm going to ask you to comment too. I, I've just put the, the very last slide up for you to stare at a little bit. This is uh, the hypothesis that, uh, that led to the, to the title of this little seminar uh, is, uh, is, is whether it is true that uh, developing a theory of mind, you've heard this from everybody, that theory of mind, uh, Ed uh, Wing called it empathy. Um, it's actually a neurobiological fact, right? We have uh, neurons, cells in our brain, which respond specifically and only to uh, events which occur in other people. These are known as mirror neurons, one of the most important recent discoveries in neuroscience. Uh, we are wired uh, to, um, to have a relationship with others, and the theory here is, is it possible uh, to, uh, to immunize people uh, by, by, by giving them exercise in empathy, uh, and it, is it true, perhaps, this is a rhetorical question, uh, that a liberal arts kind of education, which forces one to, uh, to take art history and mathematics and music and, uh, and science and so on, uh, helps one to put oneself in other people's shoes, this, this capacity to have true empathy, to actually feel what other people might be feeling. And uh, if, if that were the way one could spend one's life, would that, would that reduce the risk of becoming cyn cynical and, uh, and burning out? Not, not curing it, it would be, it would be a folly to think that it would be a cure. So what you see here, as we'll, as we'll take some more questions and comments from, from our group, but is a, is a nine-point plan that, uh, that, that actually reflects a liberal arts education which I think answers your, uh, it gives you some answers to your questions. What can one do? Um, the final comment I would make about this is that it's, it's not scientifically possible but to be sure that a liberal arts education actually does this because there, there could be reverse causality. That is, it's possible that people who uh, are like this to begin with have a tendency to be drawn to a place like Williams College. Uh, and, and therefore, it isn't Williams College that has done it to them, it, it has enhanced it uh, in them. That's, I think, unprovable. Well, you were going to respond to that comment also, Pete, so go ahead, please. Well, <clears throat> a couple of things. I, I applaud your efforts, and um, I reference a couple of um, books, one recent, one about 20 years old, by the people who developed the Burnout Index. Um, and I'm going to mispronounce the first name, but Maslach or Maslach and Leiter. Um, the first, a kind of general description of burnout and burnout theory. Uh, the second, uh, the more recent book in 2007, which uh, looks at uh, burnout from a psychological perspective. And both of them address uh, research efforts in studies, and a lot of them from Europe and Scandinavia in particular, looking at how to prevent what sorts of elements ought to be attended to. And uh, again, as difficult as those studies are, um, they give, I think, a lot of information that can be valuable from a personal standpoint in terms of preventing burnout but also in terms of working uh, in an organization or a community, um, the sorts of things I was talking about in terms of retirement, uh, to do the same thing, personal and organizational. So I'd recommend those two to you. And I'd, I'd second uh, the book, uh, The Theory of Love, uh, A Theory of Love that uh, Hank has referenced as for attachment, 
uh, to really come to understand uh, the importance of attachment theory in this context. Let's try to get as many uh, comments in as we can. We have about 10 minutes, so we'll try to, try to be brief in making your comment, and we'll try to be brief in responding if possible. Yes, please. I'm, I'm get, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Lawyers do sometimes is we had a 500-person uh, firm, and in the mid-'80s, I proposed we adopt the sabbatical program. And a couple of years later, it went into effect. So over the next, uh, really, 25 years, hundreds of uh, lawyers and years of time were spent on sabbatical. The plan was oddly every six years instead of every seven. But you got three months off, do anything you want, full pay, no effect on compensation. And looking back at it, on it, when I retired five years ago, I did sort of a summary of the effect of the program. And one of the major effects was you could tie in the end of a sabbatical to a lawyer leaving the firm to do something else they wanted to do. Become a professor, become a teacher, become a prosecutor, become a judge. But these were people who were probably going to burn out in our firm, which is very competitive and a lot of stress, and it gave them a, a system for leaving early rather than staying and burning out. I don't know how that can be applied to uh, uh, a practice like uh, Bob's, for example, if he allows people to take sabbaticals. To figure it's a, I'm so glad you spoke because uh, we wanted it, we were hoping that people in other professions and other walks of life would would comment because this is not limited to medicine, although it's been publicized most in medicine. Sadly, in the academic uh, world, the, in, the, in this country, the, um, the sabbatical uh, programs have, have dried up almo almost entirely. They still exist to some extent, but uh, the amount of, there isn't much money for sabbatical. Do you send people away? I take a sabbatical every seven years. It's great. Yeah, it's a good idea to do it. <laughs> Yeah, so they, um, they don't mind you doing it. They just won't pay for it. That's the only problem with it. I'm going to interrupt level. here. What I do can't, you do? How do you I answer that? I can't sit still any longer. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you know, we're all s sitting here. We have the capacity to uh, have consciousness. We're unique amongst primates uh, that we can use words uh, and words inside of our own mind to understand who it is that we are and why we're feeling the way we are. Um, and I think any enterprise, whether it's time off or meditation or therapy that emphasizes an individual, whether they be a lawyer or a doctor, um, becoming more comfortable with understanding who they are, having their own self-consciousness, um, it inevitably leads to um, a more peaceful adult life development. So emphasizing the uniqueness of we humans in the ability to have that internal conversation or share that conversation with people that are trained or that who love us so well uh, and say, this is who I am. This is how I got here. Uh, this is the way I understand my feelings and emotions to be occurring right now. And is this manageable? Is this uh, something that I can survive uh, over the years? So that conversation is life-giving, I'm here to tell you. And uh, Well, Bob was about to say something. You were about to uh, make a, uh, respond to his specific question about I was, it. Well, there was some comment made relative to a group like ours. I just wanted to add my, my comments about the time constraints that all physicians now have uh, ties a little bit into uh, Dave's talk earlier where government and uh, larger entities make decisions on what should be done and there's really very little, actually there's fairly good evidence now that some aspects of care because of these changes like the broad institution of uh, medical records which have electronic medical records which have benefit also have depersonalization of the doctor-patient relationship um, that ha will have profound e effects. And again, there would be a value, as Dave mentioned earlier, in finding a way to uh, truly assess how this plays a role. Yeah. Turner, are you, you going to say, uh, say something? Question. I see nothing on your list about exercise or spiritual pursuits. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Just, I think yeah, there's a, I'm sorry. Pete, you go ahead now. Pete, respond. Um, I wanted to res respond to that. I mean, people who have looked at sort of what's made my retirement successful, um, most people focus on the money, uh, the target number, what's my number. But when looking back on retirement five years, ten years down the line, um, what's made the difference for them uh, is, uh, to Hank's points, uh, the support uh, of uh, family and friends, um, the opportunities for doing something meaningful personally, spiritually, uh, exercise, uh, weight reduction, um, all taken together, uh, that those were the most important factors. And finding your passion and investing time in it. Actually, uh, it's different for different people. I would say, Turner, right, this is one area we'll, we have the whole long weekend to discuss this further ahead of us. But uh, my, my own advice here, as you see, is actually almost exactly the opposite, which is that uh, there is a lot of emphasis and has been about, uh, uh, about um, paying attention to oneself, taking care of oneself. And that includes spirituality and exercise and weight and so on and so forth. Um, I think that, that it's actually uh, more effective with regard to preventing this problem to try to think of others and not oneself. Uh, now, that, uh, that's what I mean by the issue of empathy, that, that, the, that the theory of mind I is the key, I think. I, you know, I can't prove this to you. There's no objective longitudinal prospective data about this. But it seems to me that, that, that there's that people who are more concerned about themselves become more frustrated with these, uh, these uncontrollable events around them, such as the electronic medical record or what the government is doing to us. Uh, whereas if you, if you think to yourself, uh, look at the number of people I was able to help today. How many people have had an, how many people in the world have an opportunity to do that? Look how lucky I am to be in that position. That could be help. I find that that's helpful to think of it in, in that way. Uh, when I go home, sometimes I uh, I don't have a uh, you know perfect day. It's a lot of frustration, and I'll say to Susan, it was an aggravating day. She said, "Did you help one person today? Was there one person that you helped?" And there usually is an answer. Uh, you know, yes, there's, there was one person. And uh, her view on that is that's a successful day, no matter what else happened to you during the day. So. Larry, Marty, but, can I just uh, make one? Yeah, go quick, ahead, Bob. I, I didn't mean to intimate that. I mean that these uh, outside forces um, are the are the factor. I, I, I meant to indicate that those factors are changing the way physicians have to deal with their days. Yeah, I understand. The one thing that's the salvation is just what Marty said, and you know, every day to know that you've made a difference that allows people to function the way they Yeah, I mean, work, in a, work in, a, in a resource limited environment, this doesn't require, a lot of young people think they have to travel across the world to do this. That's what all of my resident applicants tell me. They think they have to tra travel across the world. They don't, they have to just go across the street. Right across the street from my hospital, there are plenty of people who are in a resource limited environment. You don't have to go very far away to do this kind of work. If you work in a resource limited environment with people, um, you realize what they're able to do, the capacity of those professionals to, to do good work and to be happy and fulfilled without all of these creature comforts helps when you get back and you don't have the scribe to do your notes for you, right? It doesn't feel so bad that way. Larry, go ahead. I, I want to object to a cultural pejorative and definition. Retirement has a pejorative definition. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. If you go to a place that defines you because you get your compensation and you get your value, and all of a sudden, if someone tells you you're retired, I don't use it. You're going on and you're in between adventures. Transition. It's a transition of some sort. That's I just a want to say that that may help you in this discussion this weekend. Those of you who are feeling right. stressed because. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's so many people want to speak, and we're running out of time, but you know what? We can keep talking for a few minutes. Yes, go ahead. Hey, Heather. How are, Harry, how are you doing? Uh, is there anything in the health care reform agenda, or agenda, that you think would make a difference 
I want to turn to Ed Wing about this. Uh, he would be the closest to this. What, what would your answer to that yeah, be? I, I certainly don't have a clear answer on that. Um, and I, <clears throat> I'm of two minds. I, I don't think the Affordable Care Act has worked very well. I think it's uh, imposed the EMR, for example. And so when I go in and see patients, I make a, a major point not to use the computer, not to look at it for at least the first five minutes and to look at the patient and interact with the patient. If you don't do that, you're, you're not facing the patient, and you're listening, you know, but you're not watching, and, and the, the, the doctor-patient relationship is really, really ruined. So we haven't figured out, just as Bob said, we haven't figured out that aspect. I'm actually fairly conservative, but I'm a believer in healthcare systems which have been set up in Europe, from the British system and, you know, a single payer, or the other systems like in Germany and France where they control the co the government controls the costs, they have much better statistics. They work better, but they're too. Uh, Cuba, I don't, I don't quite agree with. So, but, uh, but the um, what we haven't done. In, there are too many stakeholders in this country making lots of money, from the drug companies to the hospital systems, to some of the doctors. Actually, doctors do fine, but but uh, but the major problems are in the stakeholders who are insisting on the continued structure of our current quote, competitive healthcare system, and it's dysfunctional. So, and it's a major political problem. So I don't have an answer. Sorry. My, yeah, the, my sense of, uh, is this on? Yeah, okay. My sense of what's happening now, and I saw it in my younger colleagues in terms of their anxiety, uh, was that um, many branches of medicine, for a variety of reasons that I am not cogent about, um, medicine is becoming industrialized. And I think um, that has happened for multiple reasons, but I think it's been particularly demoralizing to the physicians that are still trying to survive in this environment and the capacity to still have eye contact and shake a hand or put a hand on the shoulder or be reassuring to our patients who are scared, who are frightened, and uh, sometimes we as physicians share that fear because we don't know uh, if we can minimize their distress, either biologically or psychologically. It's so true, I though. Think you know, uh, it, it, we, we, um, we're not helpless, we uh, physicians, at, at answering your question. We're not completely helpless. It, it, there is a movement toward entropy, for, toward disorganization. Uh, and, but but when, within small pockets, one can reverse this with enough energy. And uh, I, I think many of us have the capacity to do this one person at a time. It, it is hard to fix the whole system. And there isn't any system that's perfect. I heard somebody mention Cuba. The Cuban uh, public, health, public health system is superb and done at a, with a very low budget. But many of us would, would not be satisfied with the kind of care that most people have to get for regular routine care there. So it's, the medical system is not one thing. It's, uh, it's, it's thousands of different things to different people. And my last comment here about be realistic, uh, you know, stuff happens. The mortality rate with all of our, all of our wonderful advances in genetics and uh, imaging, and neuroscience, the mortality rate is one per person. <laughs> it hasn't, hasn't changed at all with all of this medical advance. And so the, the, the problem that people have is that if you believe that life is perfect, that you're going to live forever and be well, you're going to be satisfied. You're going to be very, very unhappy and dissatisfied. Right? You, that, that's an unrealistic set of goals. And the same thing goes for the individual with their own professional life. If you think your professional life is going to be perfect and you're going to be able to do everything, athletic endeavors, play, the mu play music, raise your children, have a good marriage, everything is going to be perfect, you're not going to be very happy. That doesn't work. Now, John, we're going to have to stop, right? Yeah, I'm sorry to say this, but the, the reunion is just starting, and I guess they're having lunch outside. Is that right out there, John? I'm sorry I have to bring it to a close, but it was uh, uh, meeting you guys again was a great privilege, really it was.